the interest in getting uh, feedback uh, experiences from you about um, how you um, received at that conference during the last two days. I, th I personally think it was uh, excellent. It was a good opportunity to catch up even in bad times as we had. And I've seen uh, a number of, of fascinating presentations, a lot of uh, food for thought, so to say. The second thing I would like to mention is that Anna, uh, our wonderful host, uh, has started the conference yesterday in saying, well, this is eventually the most inclusive LBS conference ever because it's online, it's free, you need to register, but then you can basically participate. Yes. And secondly, it's probably the LBS conference with uh, having uh, a more fair share of females being responsible and uh, saying that having her as the program director, that's obviously the case. Now that brings me to our keynote speaker. Uh, our final keynote speaker today, which is Anita Krasa, she's Austrian, and she just won a very uh, prestigious award actually in uh, Austria. Uh, it's called Woman in Tech Award that is uh, given by, I think, the ministry um, even, and uh, I don't know if how much money is involved in that prize uh, or if it's the prestige only, but it demonstrates the value um, of uh, uh, the work and the research Anita is doing. Uh, she, she was really one of the pioneers in respect to openness, let's put it this, uh, let's put it this way, openness in terms of uh, data, in terms of research, in terms of software code. Uh, being open was one of her, so to say, trademarks, which made her uh, becoming very, very visible in the scene. And it fits very well that uh, uh, she heard the topic of her uh, speech uh, today will actually dealing with LBS and openness in the same time. So we are really looking forward to your presentation. Anita, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Georg, and also for the very kind introduction. Yeah, um, it's a real honor to be here and to be, have the opportunity to give this closing keynote. It's always awesome to be able to follow a whole conference and to soak up all the discussions and then to be able to reflect on it in the end and also integrate those, those thinkings a bit into the prepared presentation. So as you correctly said, I really want to talk about how we can integrate open research efforts into particularly LBS research, why we might want to do it, why currently we are probably not where we want to be and why some of us might be a bit holding back, uh, worried about the situation. We also had before the discussion about open science, open data, and is it even possible to what degree can we even open, for example, human tracking data? Of course, that is also a critical part of the discussion. So I will try to touch on some of the points and I hope that after the presentation, we can continue this discussion and hopefully advance the field in a good direction as well. Obviously, there is a lot of definitions for, for open science and what it is, but basically it, of course, doesn't just involve us as a researchers, it also includes the society as a lar at large. So it's about transparency, about our methodology, about what we observe and how we collect the data, things that were discussed at length today. It's also about sharing and reusing scientific data so that we work efficiently and that the limited resources that we have in research are used to their best uh, advantage. And it's also about communicating, so about how the outputs of our research are accessible to other researchers and to the community at large and about being transparent in the limitations of our methodology and the data we collected and about collaborating in a way that is inclusive for as many people as possible here on this slide they list as explicitly web-based tools and i think now particularly in this pandemic we saw that web-based tools are really necessary to connect people because now nobody could travel not just the people who live either in remote places or who don't have the financial means now nobody really could travel and that emphasizes these, this need for really inclusive tools and low barrier tools. 
obviously there's a lot of different um, aspects that connect to open science and th this taxonomy is just a really rough overview but i think it's already uh, showing the scope the size of the problem <laughs> of the challenge if you may uh, see want to see it that way from open access and all the discussions about different publishing schemes and do we even need the the big publishers anymore or could we do better then there's obviously the topic of open data. There is a topic of reproducible research about how we evaluate this, this research and how we um, guide people, particularly new researchers towards open science and whether it is fair to put this additional burden on them right now uh, while they are trying to establish themselves, while they might be still evaluated based on criteria that predate the open science movement. And when we go further down, it goes, of course, into the nitty gritty of which tools do we need, what are the policies, but also which software is actually suitable for open science and how can we share our developments in a way that someone who reads our paper 10 years in the future is still able to, to reproduce these results using the hopefully provided uh, software that we um, put into some repositories, some open science repositories somewhere for them to access. And I'm sure you've also heard uh, in the last couple of months, multiple presentations and different takes on these topics. For example, at the open source GIS conference in September, there were a lot of discussions naturally about openness and particularly also about open science. For example, Silvana from Brazil, she gave a really excellent keynote about the community aspects of open science. So again, not just about uh, the open source software, not just about open data, not just about open access publications, but really about engaging all the actors that are affected by the research, how we can bring in all the relevant knowledge, which is not just uh, does not just reside in the minds of the researchers of Western researchers, but also local communities, people in the places that we are looking into actually experiencing the problems that we are trying to solve and how to, for example, uh, involve them in decision making and deciding what which research to pursue and also naturally to give them tools um, to support them in being um, in advancing and helping us to advance our understanding. So why would we even want to bother with this? Obviously, the biggest and important, most important factor for open research is that it is supposed to improve research quality by promoting scholarly rigor, by making sure that uh, we can actually better verify what is published is correct, we can reproduce it. it as I already mentioned, it's also supposed to increase research efficiency. Uh, even in the short term, in my experience, this is true. Yes, in the first moment when we need to make sure that our work is actually reproducible, we need to put in some extra effort, but eventually, as soon as the revisions come in and we need to rerun the analysis again, we are already happy that we made a reproducible uh, workflow probably. And particularly if other people then can build on what we have done, then that's where research efficiency certainly is increased. I think it's also fair to say on the third part that it is a good way of enhancing visibility and engagement. I'm not so sure yet about whether it's really going to lead to higher citations, but certainly a lot of people think that it's also a good um, way to increase citations and to be get better KPIs that way. Naturally, some of some funding agencies already have included open science into their requirements. My experience, it's mostly about open data and open access, uh, not for the whole uh, process yet, but we are certainly getting there. So we might not be able to avoid it anyway. So we should better learn how to do open uh, research soon. And it's also about enhancing collaboration and community building because we can build on each other's work much more efficiently when it is open 
there is also a lower barrier for people to pick up some work and maybe get in touch later when they feel more comfortable and they feel that they have a better understanding of what it is about and how they might be able to contribute as well. And last but certainly not least, um, open science definitely has a much more straightforward path towards demonstrating the research and the societal impact because we can more easily see how different people in industry, in planning, in NGOs uh, make use of our research and the tools that we might have uh, been developing. Now, if you think particularly about LBS, location-based services and our conference, um, one of the challenges in this field certainly is the large spectrum that we have in our different research foci. Already today and the day before, we saw a lot of different examples and they really range from uh, this really hardcore STEM spectrum where we have um, deep learning methods applied to some data sets, so really data driven versus on the other side, we saw a lot of great examples with really intricate um, experimental designs where you have to think about the psychology of how you present those things, how people react to it, but really understanding this side of the research as well. And everything in between, all the engineering, like the resolution of the uh, smartphone screens and how we can even present the maps inside an app, all these things need to come together to really have a location-based services. And that's also what makes it so challenging to really then do open science uh, and to follow best practices in open science because from which um, of these um, uh, areas do we now pick the best practices? Every of these areas, they have some more or less established things that they try to adhere to. For example, do we should we think to pre-register our studies that we perform in location-based uh, service research? Should the experiments that we saw today have been pre-registered beforehand somewhere um, to see uh, later on um, whether the um, theory was confirmed or not, so that we can see all the planned research and maybe also find out about the ones that did not have good results. It might be interesting, but on the other hand side, maybe it's an overkill. And of course, on the computer science side, there's a lot of other approaches that might be relevant and uh, particularly towards reproduction and all the software tooling that is necessary to actually achieve reproduction in this area. So I really, really like this graphic, which shows uh, more of the different things that can influence um, open science. And it also highlights the one that I want to spend the last uh, minutes of my presentation on. I want to particularly focus on reproducibility because that's where I feel most qualified to talk about. Uh, talking about the data science, spatial data science aspect of LBS and related disciplines, but all the other aspects, as we already touched upon, are naturally also relevant and have to be considered within the greater picture of open science as well. So I really, really like this picture as a summary for reproducibility, um, like how computers broke science and what we can do to fix it is probably the best summary of the reproducibility crisis in data science that I would say. And basically it comes down to this one thing, the analysis works on my machine. I'm happy with that, I publish it, goodbye, next paper. That's the problem. And that has led to quite a lot of um, scandals. I'm sure many of you remember 2013, um, the Excel depression scandal, basically some economists used Excel to predict that if you spend more money than X percent of your GDP, um, that will lead to a depression. Well, turns out that they had a couple of errors in their Excel sheet. So probably was not true. Might have led to some wrong um, political decisions along the way. And what did we learn from that? Maybe some people should have had a look and tried to reproduce the data before we made political decisions based on that. 
obviously the whole thing is a huge spectrum. Um, open, there's um, the gold standard on the one hand side where you can fully reproduce the whole paper. So you have the data, you have the code. It's all documented really well. It is linked, it's all executable. But even if we cannot get quite to this gold standard yet, it is worth trying to shift from the dark side of having only a non-reproducible publication towards uh, this a gold standard by adding code, by adding data, by adding better documentation, uh, and by continuously improving. So I want to give you a couple of examples, and I hope that there's something new for all of you. These are certainly non-exhaustive. I've just picked three that I've come across that I've had some personal experience with over the last couple of months, and I want to talk about those a bit. One of them that I really very much enjoy and that I hope will gain, gain more traction is the Pi Open Science Initiative. This is actually about scientific software engineering. So it is led by a couple of really, really great people whose goal is to promote open and reproducible research through peer-reviewed scientific Python packages. And I know that similar things also happen in the world of R packages, obviously, where people review uh, software uh, packages, give feedback, and encourage scientists, uh, encourage uh, software developers uh, to create better software that can then be used by others in the community. So it's about building this, this capacity of uh, creating high quality package to, to enable scientists to share their software, to take away this fear that some of us uh, still have of, is my software good enough? Am I embarrassing myself? Do I really want this to leave my research group um, by working together with these, these people um, it takes away some of this threat because you get the assurance that they looked at it they also think it's great they think it's ready if, to be put out there and if it's not they can provide you pointers um, to how to improve it and how to make it more usable for the larger community and how to build these uh, relationships that will help you also maintain the software because it's a living thing, ideally, that should be living on for quite a while. And that also means that it will have to be maintained. And then it is helpful to know people from the related projects that might be able to help if there are any issues. Obviously, there's also other um, initiatives, particularly in the on the publication side of things, uh, quite a few of the journals in our discipline have adopted in the, over the last couple of months um, policies, including uh, mandatory data and code availability statements. For example, IJGIS um, started uh, having this policy, I think, in 2020. So you need to have the code statement and the uh, uh, data availability statement. It doesn't necessarily mean that both of these things have to be available and open to the public, but you have to make it explicit what is available and where, and you cannot just have a blanket statement of the data or the code is available upon a reasonable request. That's at least uh, ruled out. You might still be able to say, yeah, this one data set due to privacy concerns cannot be shared publicly. Um, the other um, part, um, some pre-processed aggregated version of the data set may be made available through Figshare, for example. Um, but at least it's a start of a conversation and it forces people to think what it... And finally, I'm sure many of you have followed uh, the developments at Agile and their efforts towards reproducible Agile. They actually already had two years of operation of this initiative. And I was very happy to be invited to be part of the second year. And we actually tried to reproduce the uh, papers that were presented at the conference. And we also compiled reproducibility reports of our efforts describing the partial or complete reproductions of the papers. And we showed our versions of the graphs, of the maps, um, and they 
can now all be found online and you can see how far we got and where there might still be uh, avenues to improve. Obviously, we did not reproduce all of the papers. Some of them were of a conceptual nature, so there was nothing to reproduce in this sense. Also, in some of them, obviously, we ran into issues with data or the code not being shared. Um, but I think it is a great initiative, and I would certainly encourage you to have a look, particularly at the materials that are provided uh, as a part of this initiative to inform the um, authors as well as the reviewers about what is expected of them. And uh, these guidelines include minimum requirements that are absolutely necessary if you want to have any kind of reproducible computational workflow, but also recommended practices. And I think you can see even if you don't read this right now, but this is quite an extensive list and there are a lot of footnotes there um, that provide additional information. Um, so you might be expected to provide a Docker file or virtual machine and have all these uh, script set up. So ideally we could run the whole replication just with one button click. Of, of course, that would be a dream, but I am totally aware that that's not um, the reality of many people in many different areas of research. Not everyone's a computer scientist. Not everyone has experience setting up a reproducible workflow like that, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep trying and um, learning at least the basics of how to either do replication work or publishing replicable papers. So yes, being a good open science citizen is very hard work, but it's also very, very rewarding. So actually for the last paper that I published in uh, JLBS, I made a real effort to provide the whole um, workflow that I propose in an accompanying Jupyter notebook that can be used to run um, the whole analysis to recreate all the uh, pictures that you see in the paper. And uh, so it's a Jupyter notebook. Um, there's a pre-compiled uh, HTML version that you can see that also the reviewers had so they can uh, either decide to, to run it themselves or just look at the HTML version and uh, play with that. And I also put it on GitHub naturally as you do. And I also tried to do a Docker container so that then also included the data and the Python environment so people really could play around with it. And I was thinking, yes, awesome. Now on, I can see if people use it, I get some feedback. Um, but of course, uh, things started breaking. It didn't work quite out of the box. And um, that's where also part of the community building can start. At least I noticed that someone was reading it and that someone tried to interact with the research, which is awesome by itself. And it's not just a citation count, it's an actual engagement with the research. And so through communication, we then figured out that, yeah, it was just a Python issue and now there's a new Docker file and hopefully now this container can live on for a really long time and people can play around with it. And obviously lots of people had similar ideas. I really want to give a shout out to Robin Loveless and his efforts to create all kinds of different containers for all kinds of different setups that you might be using, uh, be it with R, be it with Python, with QGIS or any other open source software. I think he's been working really, really hard and um, deserves that these images gain some widespread use and really help the, the community forward. Um, obviously also GIS Science this year had some really great efforts. They also tried to do the HL, a reproducible HL thing. Um, they even won the best paper award for the report on their reproducibility efforts. But they also found that um, Right now, the status is still that most of the papers are just not reproducible with reasonable effort. Of course, if you sit down, you re-implement everything that is written down in the paper, you might be able to reproduce it. But of course, that's not a reasonable effort that you can expect from any uh, reviewer in their volunteer time. And that's obviously one of the limitations that we will have to discuss if we want to uh, establish reproducible 
research and reviews in our conferences, in our journals? How do we deal with the limited time that the reviewers can give us? So really, what can we do? And I want to pose this question to you for a discussion afterwards. What can we do to improve reproducibility in LBS and JLBS? Is that something that we should strive uh, towards? Um, what kind of incentives could we envision? Um, what limitations do we have to pay attention to? Should we join forces with the other conferences that are out there that have already started doing that? Let me uh, end on this closing note. I know it is hard. <laughs> I feel like the kitty, but let's be kind to each other. Let's try to work together. We can figure this out and it will certainly be an improvement for the whole field if we uh, can take steps towards this direction. And um, with that, I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Anita. I think you made a strong point uh, and that's, uh, very relevant in a sense. And I think you also touched upon the point on, in terms of, uh, well, pushing us, so to say, in, in, in being aware of what, what needs to be done here. So I think it was, was an excellent uh, contribution and an outlook into where we need to go eventually as well. So uh, thanks a lot for this. Now let's look at the, at, the, at the questions. If there are any questions, please use either the chat window uh, or the Q&A, and I, I see a, a contribution from uh, uh, Jay Henderson that there was just recently a paper being published in Nature, which is uh, going that direction. Um, I see, uh, I, will, I will give the floor to uh, Anna for a moment. She has a question as well, Anna. Yeah, I have a question about the role of um, a bit of rules and regulation and mandate. For example, now in the UK, there is a huge problem between publishers and the funding bodies because they mandate open um, and gold access, what we call it. That means because it is taxpayers money allowing us to do research, we should make everything accessible to everybody else. Data should be shared and so on. But publishers do not want to do that unless we pay them extra yeah. on top of everything. So how do you see the role of politics around all the open science? Because I think as long as there is a push, people adapt and get used to that, but you know how much they can push. I think the lobbyists of scientific publishers have been very, very successful at um, converting this discussion of open science to just this um, open access um, part of the discussion and uh, positioning themselves in a way that makes the most profit for, for the publishers, but has nothing to do with what is really the uh, best solution for science, at least in my opinion, we can argue about that. Um, but I think we in the current day and age have other options, um, community driven journals um, with the technology that is available to all of us that would be much better with regards to um, maybe also speed of publication, quality of the review, and of course, uh, financial efficiency. So the cost is just ridiculous for some of those gold offerings. Okay, we do have another question from Florian. Florian, please. Uh, yes, um, uh, thank you, Anita. Very inspiring uh, keynote. And I'm, I'm very happy that you mentioned actually at the beginning that uh, these all these new exciting ideas and, and requirements to a certain extent uh, can also be an additional burden, particularly for young researchers, because they have to now implement all these new ideas with reproducibility and packaging everything up and documenting everything. And still they're in a publication um, ecosystem where they have to follow the, these old fashioned protocols. I, I right now have a, I have a paper uh, under review with a journal um, and, and I try to, you know, to provide the code, to provide notebooks, to make everything reproducible. But I also have to put up with a really arcane editing system. I, I'm waiting months for the reviews. It's really, and, and I'm just thinking something has to give eventually, you know. And I would much rather work on uh, pre-registering actually my next study than spending months and months in an editing process that, that feels 
like so dated and so 19th century or 20th century, I should say. Um, so do you have any ideas of what we can get rid of if we implement all these exciting new things? <laughs> I think we as a community would have a lot of power. Obviously the individual, particularly early career researcher has very limited power. They can choose not to publish in a journal that is particularly slow or keep sending them um, uh, continuous streams of word files to edit back and forth where someone has mangled all the um, equations. Um, but we, all have to come together and we have to decide to to make a stand and um, maybe just set up our our own system and of course the the evaluation and the hiring boards are then a, a completely other thing and i think georg can probably um say more about that because he actually is at the university versus i am in applied research where things probably work a bit differently, but do you see that the universities are changing gears with regards to open science and evaluating uh, junior researchers differently? I, I, I do think so. I do think that there is some kind of change and evolution and progress, but it is, it is a big vessel. <laughs> it is a big vessel. It takes time to make any movements. I do think that there is, um, there is a, an evolution um, because, uh, but, but, but I mean, in, in, in respect to the value uh, of, of your point to make it open, reproducible, and to give that a value itself for the publication, for the work, for the research quality, so to say, I think it's true what you say that it's the community which has to drive that, which has to push. But I also think that at the end of the day, it needs to be quantified. It needs to be part of that value you get out of it. So the fact that you get out of it be, being published in a an, in an high ranked journal must be somehow multiplied by that you follow that particular rules then. So it needs to be somehow be put into numbers at the end of the day. And if, I think that will be the push which will be needed to, to have that kind of discussion about reproducibility, about openness being valued on the same level as all the other factors or indicators which we use to judge your quality basically currently. And as long as that is not done, it's more or less, it's more than based on, well, okay, I think I have some sympathy for this or I don't, huh? that, then it's always tricky to, to find out about it. So we need to put it in numbers, I think at the end of the day. And that, that's why I think it's very important. And uh, yeah, I mean, Florian has, has mentioned that uh, very, very nicely. I think we, we had that discussion in our group as well about this. And it seems to be, uh, yeah, it's a long way to go still. I have. Uh, I see that Ushka has, uh, has has a question as well. Ushka, please. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I have a comment on what you just said because I mean, I as you know from my keynote yesterday, I work a lot with movement ecologists, and ecology has been open for way longer than any of GI science or LBS or computer science disciplines. And uh, I think this is just happening. I mean, I don't think we need to, in particular, like younger people and junior researchers and so on. They're just, that's how they work. They don't actually even know how to not work openly. So last, not last year, the year before the pandemic, I was at this large movement ecology conference in Italy. There were about 300 people and uh, they made like a poll of, are you willing to open data? And everybody, like from June, assistant professors, postdocs, PhDs were just like, yeah, duh, that's what we do, right? Because this is just, this has started and everybody's doing it and it's the normal way of doing it. And I think GI science is going towards this. Uh, so as Anita showed that IJGIS, as I'm associated with, or I, with IJGIS, we started this in 2019 and nobody has a problem complying. I don't have, remember any authors having a problem with providing code and data. <laughs> Okay, maybe it won't be open in the end because you cannot share all the data, but they provide it for review. And then there is the data availability statement, which explains that, okay, if my data are open, here's the DOI on Zenodo or whichever repository you put your data in. And uh, if it's not open, you explain why it's not open. And sometimes you have to contact the, the authors in order um, to get the data if that's what you want. Plus what I see here in the UK, um, I just they just do this, I mean, for us. So now I don't even have to do it anymore. I just publish the paper 
And then my, my research office takes my data and puts it in the university repository or takes my code, puts it in the university repository and it's everything there and open and available. So I think this is just happening and... Uh, that sounds like an excellent service you have there. Yeah, but this is like since the pandemic. So I don't know, anyway, they started yeah. it. But on I was the also... other hand, I also want to say that this is happening, but not everywhere, because I also have a very negative experience in requiring some a paper to be reproducible from computer science. So just last week, I was invited to review a paper from one of the IEEE journals, like a big name uh, computer science journal. And uh, in the review, they asked me if it's reprodu reproducible. And I was like, well, there's no code. It's not reproducible. And it, there should be code and so on. And then the editor got back to me. And I got really negative feedback that why am I asking for the code? And I'm like, well, you know, it has to be reproducible. So there should be code. So people should be able to run it. And then he told me that there has been lots of discussions and that IEEE is basically against this. So that you should not be providing code. So. I don't know what's the solution. Um, it seems that some parts of science are moving towards this, others not so much. Um, I guess the question is where do we find ourselves in this or where do you personally find yourselves in this? So I don't know, I'm all for open science. So just, just a comment on what, what um, Georg was saying. A comment yeah. and a question. Yeah, I'm a question. you want to. Thanks so much for sharing these both perspectives, Ushka. I was also wondering about ecology, whether part of the story was that for a very long time you simply had these, or they simply had those repositories like MoveBank, where I guess it's also a question of prestige for your group if you're represented there, if you have papers and data sets on these kinds of repositories. It's just part of being this community that you have something represented there. Um, to show that you're serious about the whole thing. And maybe if we had the same thing in LBS, um, people would also naturally, uh, not even thinking about it, uh, contribute to that because they want to be part of this um, larger community. But then, of course, again, we run into trouble that so much of what we do is human movement and privacy relevant and might not be able, we might not be able to share it in the same way as you can do if you tag a bird. Yes, I think that that is exactly a question I would like to propose maybe as well. But before I do so, I would like to mention that you have got a lot of congratulations in the chat wing. Or somebody especially liked your cute kitty images. And Christian mentioned that there is actually a, a platform in R which you can use. It's called O2R. Uh, that's a platform for to create the reproducible papers. Mm -hmm. And I would like to actually ask Sven. He has made a very interesting... Uh, statement about that universities provide um, services in that respect. Sven, do you want to uh, post that comment yourself, please? Uh, am I able to speak? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you are able to speak now. Great, uh, just the camera is not turned on. Um, yes, I heard from some um, former colleagues of mine that now work as data privacy officers, no, privacy, sorry, um, wrong topic, um, data reproducibility researchers and officers that um, that's a topic that's gaining traction that like more and more um, universities are currently having a position for people that um, help other researchers with um, like making their work reproducible. I mean, even if you don't have much of a strong computing or programming background, um, there is help that you can get for making your research reproducible. And I mean, even if it's just the first steps, like putting everything in a GitHub repository or trying to fit everything from your local machine into a way that can be executed um, by somebody else, like it's a good start already. So I'm actually not aware um, if there is a, I don't know, an overview of what kind of um, services are there already, but um, it's definitely something that got the attention of um, research and also of universities recently. Yeah, thanks for, for adding that. Um, I think there is a lot of services, of new kinds of services, be it research data management, be it uh, reproducibility, um, um, coaches um, that are now being more and more common in different universities, uh, which might uh, lead us again towards a problem with inclusiveness and um, rich 
universities versus other institutions that cannot afford the same level. Um, I remember a lot of discussions also in this direction. Again, how inclusive is open science? Is it maybe again just for the ones who can afford to do open science? Then not with the divide between junior researchers and uh, established researchers, but actually what kind of resources does your institution have to support you in doing your open research? But it's excellent if you have access to this kinds of resources. Okay, we do have another uh, comment kind of from Lars. Uh, Lars, do you want to present that yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, well, it's, it's just something that I've, yeah, I've seemed to realize um, that throughout JS exercises, that we teach our, our master students at Ghent University. Um, yeah, I've just said, okay, you, you, have to, you have to hand in a sort of cartographic model um, every time they do their, their analysis in, in QGIS, you can make it in the processing modeler and then uh, they can export it as a PDF or even as sort of Python code. Um, and in the beginning, they like, yeah, they're really annoyed with it. Um, but then I try to like, uh, yeah, persuade them and tell them, okay, um, it's, it's all for reproducibility. So I can see the things you are doing, they are correct. Uh, but then they also realize that, okay, after a while, sometimes my research wasn't good. I have to rerun something and then I have to, I don't have to do it like from scratch. Um, so yeah, I think if you yeah, start to like confront them with this at an early age, well, not really early, but uh, while they are still students, uh, that they seem to uh, get the importance of it. And um, so maybe that's, yeah. Okay, Anita, you want to comment on that? I absolutely agree with what Lars said. I think you can go very many ways. For example, I also have a, a QGIS course where I particularly take them through those steps and then I follow up with, yeah, now actually take your model into a standalone Python script, then take this standalone Python script, put it into a plugin that you could even share with the rest of your classmates. So once they see that all these steps, it's always just a tiny add-on, some little bit more to learn and it makes you so much more um, powerful what you can actually produce. It's really eye-opening to many of them and I hope that at least few, a few of them will adopt this way of working. Yeah, so I think that's 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 really a good point last presented that it really starts in the education eventually to make to make future researchers aware of the uh, of the methods and importance and relevance of this uh, discussion I guess. Now Anita my question to you would be also you know there's this English saying um, there's nothing like a free lunch. <laughs> So what is the price? What are the limitations we eventually have to face when we go in this direction, when we go in, into openness in all kinds of senses? Is there any price? The most obvious price that um, researchers pay initially, I think, is, of course, that you have can only spend so many hours of the day working. And if you decide that you want to publish a really well-rounded scientific software package, then that probably comes at the cost that you will not be publishing uh, five different use case papers uh, using your software because you're focused on making something that is actually, that others can use and uh, that they can um, use without you holding their hand necessarily. Um, so that the number of publications probably goes down, but I hope that the quality of uh, papers and the citations that you receive on your, for example, so related software papers, that those would go up. That's for the scientific software engineering part of open science and for reproducible science. On the open data side, I think the situation is much more complicated, not just a privacy issue, but also the cost related to collecting the data. So some institution will have to cover the cost of collecting the data. And then if they open source it, um, obviously there's the fear of many that this data will be used and exploited way, way faster by other research groups than the original ones who, who collected the data. And I'm not sure how, how valid this problem is, how um, prevalent it would be in LBS, where many of us, we work in specific locations and we are not necessarily interested in completely different part of the world, but we might want to be able to transfer some methods and test it there. Um, 
So these kinds of things with uh, someone has the initial effort, but might not reap all the profit from this effort themselves. Yeah, yeah. That, that might be an issue here as well. Yeah, I guess, um, as, as I said, I think you opened uh, a box of awareness, uh, which uh, which we need to take in consideration. And I really think it will be a, con a topic of continuation. And I, I really would like to see uh, your point being heard and also maybe uh, being pushed again to our community, uh, as you mentioned, about the LBS conference as well as the journal, uh, that those are good points which you presented and we might uh, stay in kind of consultation contact on how to proceed further with this, more or less. Huh? Uh, at that point, I would like to, uh, uh, as I see no urgent questions coming across the chat window channels now, I would like to take the opportunity to thank you again, Anita, for this excellent uh, final keynote in that conference. Um, I think it was great. Um, to uh, it, was, it was food for thought again, and it was uh, future oriented. So in that sense, uh, highly relevant to, to us. Thank you again, Anita, for this. Thanks so much. And, and yeah, let's stay in touch. Yeah. And with